President Petro Poroshenko gave a State of the Nation speech a few weeks ago to the Ukrainian parliament. It was a long speech. They love them in Ukraine, um, just like in the Soviet Union. Um, if you want to read the think tank, which is the official Ukrainian think tank, the National Institute of Strategic Studies, report which backs up the president's speech, you're welcome to do so. There will be a web link to this with this video blog. It's only 960 pages long. Um, so good bedtime reading. Um, I, the, the best way, I think, is to, um, as it were, depackage, um, unpackage the various elements of what is usually lumped together as reform. But reforms mean a lot of different things, depending on the areas you're touching. And I would break this down into six areas. It makes it far easier to digest. The first one, um, and, and some of these are more positive than negative, others are more negative than positive. Uh, the first one I would look at would be national identity. It's obviously a big deal for a lot of Ukrainians these days because there's a war with Russia going on. Putin's aggression against Ukraine, and of course it's a big deal for many members of the Ukrainian diaspora. And here, um, I don't believe we can really be critical of, of what is taking place in Ukraine. Um, the president of Ukraine has um, adopted an, 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 a policy of supporting Ukrainian nation-building, but civic nation-building, not ethnic nationalism, He's supporting national integration, supporting, um, very importantly, issues such as decommunization. There were five laws adopted in April, May 2015. Um, the, the, the revival of the Institute of National Memory under Dr. Volodymyr Vyatrovich, um, the former KGB archives, which are now ensconced at the Security Service of Ukraine and under the ABLE leadership of Andriy Kohut. So all of this is progressing very well. Um, it's very much in line with the kind of nation building that was un being undertaken under President Lenny Kuchma. Um, Viktor Yushchenko was a bit more ethnic nationalist, but certainly a long ways away from the more Russophile presidency and Sovietile, Sovietophile presidency of Viktor Yanukovych. Uh, Ukraine has um, gone um, to a great degree down the road of decommunization. It, it had already um, launched the process of de-Stalinization. This was done in the Ukrainian diaspora over 30 years ago in 1983 on the 50th anniversary of the Ukrainian famine, the Holodomor. And this was continued in Soviet Ukraine and then in independent Ukraine with a small gap in the Yanukovych era. So that's continued as well. Um, and um, progress there uh, can be seen in, in the publication this month of Anne Applebaum's new book on the Ukrainian famine, which is um, excellent, truly excellent. Um, and it's about time, um, it's about 30 years since the publication of Robert Conquest's book, Harvest of Sorrow. So in those kind of areas, um, I don't think we have much to criticize. Um, President Poroshenko is very much hands-off. He's very much uh, in following in the line of, I would say, civic nation-building rather than more a more ethnic area, which is very common in Europe, including in Poland um, and, and, and in Russia. Uh, new legislation adopted in Ukraine this summer um, moves Ukraine in a, in a, in, 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 in along a path, making it actually more liberal than multicultural Canada. Um, local TV and radio in Ukraine will henceforth have to have 50% of its content in Ukrainian. That's less than what Quebec demands, which is two-thirds of radio and TV in French. Um, so Ukraine, um, so people who might be critical of that a step taken by Ukraine should look to Canada, which everybody praises as multicultural. It's actually more liberal than what Quebec demands for French uh, language in, in TV and radio. Um, the uh, second area that's worth looking at is the area which is very broadly defined as national security. And here there are many elements to it. 
Um, particularly, I, I would say the issue of the European Union. Ukraine now is uh, fully uh, part or, or involved in the association agreement. It was launched um, a few weeks ago where Ukraine became um, a full, as it were, participatory member. That includes the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement as well. So Ukraine is on the path of integration without membership. This is the um, association agreement that was signed back in sort of what was launched back in 2009, signed um, under Yanukovych, um, went into decline because of the arrest of political opponents, and then now is fully on board. That includes um, a visa-free regime for Ukraine, and uh, it, as President Poroshenko on numerous occasions points out, this is very much something that is irreversible. Um, we can thank a m- number of factors here, but in particular we can thank good old Vladimir Putin for um, turning Ukrainians away from any interest in Russian and Eurasian integration. So uh, Russia's military or Putin's military aggression against Ukraine has certainly ensured that Ukrainians and Russians are no longer fraternal brothers, the old Stalinist slogan that it was being used by Russia until recently. So EU progress. And that also includes um, what I would say is the success in maintaining Western sanctions against um, Russia. Um, Thankfully, again, Russia often overplays its hands. It did this in the 1990s when Lini Kuchma was elected on a moderate pro-Russian platform in 1994. Uh, Boris Yeltsin did not uh, fly to Kiev for another three years. Maybe he was too um, incapacitated, not sober enough to do so, but certainly didn't arrive for three more years um, to sign a treaty on the Ukrainian-Russian border. And in the meantime, Ukraine turned westwards towards NATO. So Russia has a habit of turning its friends into enemies. And it did this with its massive intervention in the U.S. presidential elections, which changed dramatically Western opinion about uh, Russia. Um, In 2016, uh, the West woke up to the fact that Russia or Putin Uh, had long believed that he and Russia were at war with the West. Um, This has been going on for a long time, ever since really the Orange Revolution in 2004, through various antics that Russia has been involved in, including the invasion of Georgia in 2008. But the West didn't really want to accept reality. Um, And Barack Obama, for example, only a year after the invasion of Georgia, tried to do a reset of Russian-US relations, which failed. But this massive intervention um, into U.S. presidential elections is something that's positive for Ukraine in the sense that it's turned um, the U.S. and many Western countries who have also suffered from Russian intervention, France, for example, um, against President Putin. There has not been a consensus on Russia in the U.S. between the Democrats and Republicans like we have today since 60s or earlier. Um, The uh, new package of sanctions adopted by the U.S. against Russia are very tough. They had unanimous support in both houses of the U.S. Congress, and they cannot be reversed by Donald Trump. Um, There's specific clauses in there. This all works um, in favor of Ukraine. Also, growing talk about potentially the U.S. sending military support to Ukraine which I think is actually potentially very likely. Um, Trump will do, try to do anything to, tr- to distract from claims that he has been pro-Russian now with the investigations going into his election campaign taking place with the FBI and special prosecutors. So on that area, um, NATO as well has been revitalized by Russian military aggression And that, again, is something uh, positive for Ukraine because Ukraine collaborates and cooperates with NATO in various formats. And certain members of NATO, Canada, Poland, Lithuania, Britain, US, um, and a few maybe other countries are actively involved 
in um, uh, in providing reforms and training of Ukrainian um, security and military forces. Very important is also in the realm of national security has been the transformation of Ukraine's Soviet era, in effect, hadn't really changed much, Ministry of Internal Affairs. This monstro- this monster, which was 300,000 strong, just to give you an idea how much of a monster this was, Britain, which has a population of 20 million more than Ukraine, has a police force, police and prison force, of only 120,000. So Ukraine had 300,000. Um, this has been transformed uh, with the help of Canada and the U.S., into a European-style police force. If you go now to most Ukrainian cities, you will see policia, no longer militia. Um, this also includes the, um, the, um, the closure of the, the Berkut um, riot police unit, which was involved in the sniper atrocities, the murders of Euroda- Euromaidan protesters, and the creation of a new SWAT-type police, for- police unit, the transformation of uh, um, interior ministry troops. Um, they had this horrible Soviet title called internal troops. Um, only an authoritarian or totalitarian regime needs internal troops to be used against its own citizens. These, this has been transformed into a, a national guard, a kind of a, an elite unit similar to what we have in places in Europe like uh, Italy's Carabinieri or Spain's civil guard. Um, and France's CRS. So in in many areas of national security, there have been a lot of progress. But of course, one of the biggest areas of progress has been Ukraine's military, which has been dramatically transformed. Um, Ukraine, um, all Ukrainian presidents, including Viktor Yushchenko, um, did not invest in Ukraine's military um, and allowed it to degenerate. Of course, this, this was even more the case under Yanukovych, and Ukraine therefore had very little to fight with against Russian aggression in 2014. Um, Today there's been a massive transformation. Ukraine is ranked in terms of world um, armed forces, it's ranked at about 30, just a bit lower than Canada in terms of the the size and quality of its armed forces. Um, It's one of the biggest and, and best in Europe today, and um, it's had a, a lot of I- input from the, a revitalized Ukrainian military-industrial complex. Um, and the, just this summer, a new report by uh, the Center for Eastern Studies in Warsaw described Ukraine's army as the best it's ever had. So certainly that is something to be proud of. Um, and that will only uh, improve with time. Um, making Russia very uncomfortable about the fact that Ukraine's army could very easily retake the Donbass um, if it wasn't for a Russian security guarantee to the separatist forces. Third area we could look at is the whole issue of socio-economic and fiscal reforms. Um, These are very much launched, um, these are very much unpopular, as they are in every country, and were launched by the Yatsenyuk government um, in 2014-2015. They were adopted in in line with what IMF um, demanded. In previous IMF programs, um, Ukraine had adopted adopted the stabilization aspect of IMF programs, but not the follow-on structural reforms. And on this occasion, Ukraine did follow on with the structural reforms. Maybe not everything. Certainly there are um, areas which are still in dispute whether Ukraine will move ahead of, in those, such as pension reform and land reform. Land reform is very contentious, the whole question of privatizing land. But on the whole, this has been a spurt of reform, the last we saw of which was um, under President, under Prime Minister Yushchenko, back in 2000-2001. There have also been some progress in the field of energy, uh, which was always a kind of milking cow for corruption in Ukraine. Um, There are no longer these uh, very opaque uh, 
gas intermediaries, which used to siphon off billions of dollars each year from, in effect, from the Ukraine state budget for the um, benefit of uh, gas tycoons like Dimitro Firtash, um, who is uh, who the U.S. and Spain would like to extradite from from Austria for corruption charges. So again, that's another area that um, has been pushed by the IMF and other institutions, Western institutions, the European Union, and where there has been some progress. Where there's been, um, I would say, far less progress is in the field of politics and in, in particular rule of law. Um, Ukraine still suffers, um, as, it, as it always has since 1991, except uh, for certain small periods of time, like after the Orange Revolution and, the, and after the Euromaidan, and this is something common throughout the former USSR, the whole problem of very low public trust um, and faith in state institutions. That hasn't really changed very much. Um, this is very much, of course, related to the problem of um, corruption. Uh, Ukrainians tend to believe that uh, people go into politics or into, be, or into parliament um, not to help their constituents, but to make money. Um, so that whole question of public trust in state institutions is, is something that still has bedeviled Ukraine and still certainly requires dealing with. And ver that's very much tied to other issues which many people won't actually realize. Issues such as, for example, paying taxes. Ukrainians are not great at paying taxes. Um, and um, and they have, there is a large shadow economy in Ukraine. Anything up to half of the economy is in the shadow or the underground. Um, Ukrainians don't pay taxes. They argue it's a self-defeating prophecy because they say, well, the elites don't pay them either because they send their money offshore to tax havens. Um, so that in turn all creates a financial um, a problem for the state budget. Uh, with money going offshore from the elites and with the people lower down not really being that happy about paying their taxes. Now, not paying taxes, you know, paying taxes is something that's very much associated with with countries with good governance, US, Canada, Northern Europe. Um, so Ukraine isn't unique. I mean, this problem of, of shadow economies and uh, low compliance of paying taxes is very common to Southern Europe. So in that sense, Ukraine is very similar, but it's certainly a problem. The other area which is um, problematical is the question of political parties. Um, you uh, in, in the 27 post-communist states, the countries that have uh, progressed the most with democratization have been those which have adopted parliamentary constitutions, those which have adopted presidential constitutions, which is the majority of the countries in so-called Eurasia, tend to have authoritarian and very corrupt systems, i.e. Russia. Ukraine's had a parliamentary system um, in the Yushchenko era and since 2014. Um, the problem is that a parliamentary system needs political parties, like Canada or Britain, um, and Ukraine doesn't have any. Um, the closest that may be approached some kind of political parties were, ironically, the party regions, um, and Fatherland Party, um, are led by Yuli Tymoshenko. But the party regions is gone, and the Fatherland Party is really a, a pale image of its, what it used to be, um, um, and it suffers from the same problem that all political parties suffer from, which is that there is a cult of personality. Parties are believed to be owned by leaders. So that is a, a problem area, and it's a problem area even though Countries like Canada, Britain, Germany, um, the Netherlands, Sweden have invested funding over the last 20 years into trying to help to build up Ukrainian political parties. Um, but that hasn't really been that successful. The final area which is worth looking at is the whole question of rule of law and state building. I mean, there has been progress in creating new, new institutions, but those uh, new institutions um, still haven't really shown their teeth, as it were. And that's, in turn, is especially the question of people going to jail for the crimes committed under Yanukovych. Um, massive corruption, creation of a mafia state, 
murders on the Euromaidan and Yanukovych's treason. He called for Russia to intervene into the Crimea. Um, this in turn creates popularity for what uh, many Westerners and Ukrainians like President Poroshenko call populists, i.e. Mikhail Saakashvili and Yulia Tymoshenko. And we know that Saakashvili has stormed his way in, typically Saakashvili, typically Georgia maybe, stormed his way into Ukraine just a couple of days ago. Tymoshenko was, was waiting to greet him. And certainly that will be a, a formidable um, fourth um, Tymoshenko and Saakashvili to uh, oppose Poroshenko at the next uh, presidential elections, which will be in 2019. Not that long, not that long ahead. Um, you know, if we, um, the election campaign will probably begin in the autumn stroke spring of next year. Saakashvili cannot be elected Ukrainian president. He hasn't uh, lived in Ukraine for five years um, or hasn't had Ukraine citizenship for five years prior to 2019 elections, in any way his citizenship has been revoked. <laughs> so so he can't stand. But nevertheless, he can mobilize. He's a great orator. Um, populists, if that's what you want to call them, like uh, Timoshenko, um, like Trump, um, like uh, Saakashvili, are good, very good speakers. But as we know in the case of Trump and other populists, um, they're very bad when they come to power because they just don't know how to rule. Um, so it's one thing sprouting off great rhetoric, another thing actually being government. But certainly Poroshenko um, will not be, uh, I don't think, threatened by a pro-Russian grouping or candidate, as was usually the case in the past in Ukrainian elections, um, you know, whether it was Yushchenko versus Yanukovych or Timoshenko versus Yanukovych. In the next presidential elections, it will be Poroshenko versus Timoshenko and Saakashvili. Um, and that will be something that Poroshenko will have a, a tough job in, um, in defeating. Um, uh, I, I don't think he's, you know, he's a write-off, but certainly um, he certainly will have a very tough job from these people, particularly over the questions of rule of law, justice, people going to jail. That is what um, Ukrainians are angry about. I mean, they have had the... Um, the downside, if you want to call it, of reforms, social, economic, and, and fiscal, and other reforms, you know, mass increases in utility prices, for example, lower standards of living. Um, so they've had the kind of the the shock of the of the reforms, but not the therapy. By therapy, I mean heads on spikes, people going to jail, and and that's, for example, in the case of the Berkut black, so-called black uh, unit. Um, because they wore black uniforms with uh, yellow armbands, which were the ones who shot the protesters on the Euromaidan. Um, those, uh, majority of those fled to Russia. They've all been given Russian citizenship, and they all now are working for Putin's uh, riot police. Um, only five were uh, managed to be put on trial. Their, their, their convictions are probably likely next year, just in time for the elections. Um, but 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 that whole question of um, the the authorities not pushing enough to put people behind bars, you know, people want to see justice. They they understand justice by the elites being accountable for their and responsible for their actions, and they don't feel that's been the case. That that will be, I think, a big question mark, big question in the next elections, and a big question around which the saakashvili Tymoshenko alliance will mobilize and criticize President Poroshenko. But, you know, we shouldn't assume that this field of rule of law has all been bad. Um, there have been the creation of new institutions like the National um, Anti-Corruption Bureau. Um, the, uh, there is new institutions to be still built, like a special corruption prosecutor, a special anti-corruption court. Um, there have been e-declarations which have forced state officials and members of parliament to declare their, um, their, their, their capital, as it were, their financial assets. Um, and there have been a record number for the first time in Ukraine of members of parliament whose immunity has been revoked so that they can be put on trial. So there's limited progress. 
but certainly it's not all black and white. Um, but but probably not enough to satisfy that widespread hunger um, at a time of um, declining living standards. And certainly um, Ukraine has been unable to deal with this question of oligarchs. I mean, President Poroshenko did talk a few years ago about the whole question of de-oligarchization. Well, uh, <laughs> the oligarchs are still... Uh, running the commanding heights of the economy and the electronic media, particularly TV, are in their hands. Um, so that really hasn't um, taken place. So to to um, to do a summary at the end, I would say that in terms of um, national identity and certainly national security, President Poroshenko has done a very good job. Um, if you, especially if you think about this, how terrible Ukraine looked at. That in 2014. Putin really believed that Ukraine was going to disintegrate. All it required was a bit of a push in 2014. That didn't happen. On the question of socioeconomic fiscal reforms and energy reforms, um, maybe it's sort of more, you know, 60-70% over 30% in favour, maybe a bit less. In terms of politics and rule of law, I would say that's still a work in progress. Um, and not surprisingly in the question of rule of law and fighting corruption, that that is always going to be the most difficult um, to deal with. Um, but to say that nothing's been done, in, even in those areas, would be wrong, particularly if we compare, as we should, the Poroshenko era, which is after a revolution, to the Yushchenko era after the Orange Revolution. Um, under Yushchenko, literally nothing was done. The whole time was wasted in squabbling, against Timoshenko and no major reforms really were undertaken and Ukraine's army and security forces continue to decline so compared to the Yushchenko era this is far far better um, and um, on that note um, we can thank uh, Ukrainian citizens and um, some Ukrainian politicians for um, assisting that move, as it were, away from um, what was called a kind of a hybrid, semi-corrupt um, economic um, and social system. And we can also thank, um, of course, uh, Vladimir Putin for uh, forcing Ukrainians to finally realize that they um, have to uh, do a lot more to ensure the, the independence and sovereignty of their country. Um, one area being that for the first time ever, Ukraine now is energy independent of Russia, something that the Ukrainian leaders talked about for 20 years. Only now has it happened in the last two years. So, again, also, thank you, Vlad. On that note, we'll end.